Yeah, no, we, we were we were very blessed in central Otago um, when the country report comes out, um, you know, when the generalizations start to come out, um, which get heavily influenced by um, the larger regions, um, what, you know, what the weather was like in Marlborough or Hawke's Bay, Martinborough, um, uh, there will be, we will get tarnished by that because, you know, that's, uh, Central Otago is only about 5% of, of New Zealand's wine. But um, we had a very, very good summer in Central Otago. We're protected by the mountains, so we normally have very low rainfall. But we're also protected from the easterly weather systems because of our inland location. So we had um, no concerns with the growing season whatsoever. Um, uh, slightly warmer than average, so we started picking earlier and under very dry um, um, conditions and also a little bit warmer than normal. So we had to harvest quite quickly. Um, the fruit was in very good, clean condition, uh, great flavors, um, you know, well-balanced um, chemistry. So no, we were blessed and, and normal size yields too. So a very, very good vintage. Yeah, no, we, we had, um, you know, we had to be very careful because um, you know, New Zealand eliminated COVID back in um, you know, March, April 2020 when it first arrived. So we, we've been under elimination and we hadn't had COVID um, after we had that very successful elimination. In, so we hadn't had, there, there was COVID in Auckland a couple of times, but never, never in our communities for two years. So we had to live with COVID. <laughs> for the first time and you know which was interesting because everybody else around the world just says oh get on with it you know <laughs> what are you panicking for but when it's when it hits your community for the first time and you're a small crew of four people making wine um and if you lose one person the chances are that it's going to be a cascade effect as the next person gets sick so that was um always in the back of our minds um to be very safe and fortunately touch wood um, you know, we haven't had anybody get sick inside the winery um, to date. We've still got a little bit more work to do, but largely the vintage is finished. So that was always in our mind for the vintage. Um, uh, another interesting aspect was we were able to welcome Nigel, the owner. Um, he came back to um, for the harvest, so he hadn't been able to come to New Zealand for two years and Nigel is fabulous in the kitchen so we had lots of very nice lunches so that was a uh, a memorable part of the the vintages having Nigel back around the lunch table and um and and his delicious uh, cuisine managing the fermentations and the barreling down uh sometimes we have a, a fifth person um but this year we were a little bit understaffed uh, uh, just with the covid conditions um um well certainly in the, all of new zealand um you know, we have uh, not the usual supply of the, the young backpackers that they, all returned home over the last year or two. And, you know, with no new ones able to come to New Zealand for two years, uh, we had to rely almost 100% on you know, New Zealand pickers. We had about 50, 50 people in the, in the vineyards picking grapes, uh, mostly from the local community, but some travel from uh, three hours away um mm. you know we get quite a few regulars that come back and help us every year just for the you know three week harvest period so um we're fortunate in that regard that um you know we weren't um you know didn't have any challenges getting getting the fruit off when we needed it needed to uh, I, I think some other properties probably did but you know they're they're places that don't have their own full-time crew mm. or um uh, uh, not as personable as you know so our small yeah. operation is which is easier for us to maintain a loyal crew that comes back year after year um so yeah and i imagine there were some compromised decisions or picking decisions being made um just because of lack of staff i think there was also a lot more machine harvested fruit in central otago sorry it is not common to have you know machine harvested fruit only for the less expensive wines but i think there was a much greater percentage that was machine harvested this year just to help you know alleviate the the labor shortages mm. but we didn't um have to resort to that there's you know it's no way that we wanted to be machine harvesting
I mean, generally, I mean, I've been here, that was my 26th harvest. So certainly the last five, um, seven years have been warmer than say the first five or seven for sure. Um, uh, but not significantly so, not, not, not like the, the impacts, you know, that continental climates uh, have seen with climate change um, because of our small land mass in the, you know, the middle of a cold, you know, Southern Ocean. Um, climate change has not affected us that significantly to date, although, I mean, there has been a general warming. Um, uh, but you know, 19, 20, 21 were all um, um, average or slightly cool. So this was, um, you know, to, this was the warmest vintage we'd seen since 2018. So it's not as though they're, you know, warm every year. Uh, 16 was a, a, a warmer, um, a warmer growing season. We had quite a hot spell um, in February, which is about six weeks before the harvest. And that um, uh, sort of advanced the ripening. So it was a, it was quite a, a, again, like quite a fast harvest, not too dissimilar from 22. But in, um, it was that warm period in February around Veraison, which um, seemed to reduce the accumulation of um, stable anthocyanins, the, um, uh, the, the color pigments. And so the 16s, are, all the Pinot Noirs are, are lighter in 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 body and and um, color than say definitely the the 17s or um, even the 18s which was another warmer vintage so it was it was an intriguing year um th that so that they're i think on the labels on the 16s they all say 13.5 mm -hmm. um whereas no normally for us we would be 14 percent so that's kind of ironical um, in a warmer year that you would have a lower sugar, yeah. but it just meant that the flavors ripened ahead of the sugar. And so we we're able to pick at lower sugar levels to have you know better balanced wines. So they're very pretty, very elegant wines. Um, they're more finer boned than normal. So say compared to the 17s, which are quite robust and full bodied, the 16s are, um, have a lovely sort of finesse and transparency with them. I think you um, also have to, um, uh, you know, consider relativity because um, in central Otago, we're used to having quite deep, dark colors and quite robust um, Pinot Noir flavors. So when we say the vintage was lighter and finer boned with greater transparency, when we take those wines to the international market, we often, and we, we, we think, oh, the wines are not as deep and not as profound because of that. We often find um, our international customers uh, more excited with those vintages because it reminds them more of um, Burgundy with having you know, greater finesse and detail and transparency um, because great Pinot Noir or great Burgundy um, shouldn't be about, you know, um, you know, dark, deep colors and, you know, heavy concentrated wines. It's about, you know, detail and finesse and, um, you know, the pinosity. So, um, and, and in terms of how they've aged, um, I mean, they're still, you know, pretty young wines. I mean, they're 2016, so um, been in the bottle um, 21. So yeah, five years in the bottle. So they've, um, they've lost their, their prime primary um, immediacy. Um, they've started to take on some secondary characters, but they're, you know, they still have another 10 years um, easily um, left in them. So I was tasting, um, I had to do an interview with um, Hong Kong last night and I was mm -hmm. uh, tasted a couple of the 20. So I have that fresh in my memory and definitely the 16s are um, love, have a lovely transparency, a lovely elegance and delicacy, uh, finer boned, you know, they're not heavy, robust, concentrated um, um, wines, but um, they have a lovely perfume. They're not overripe, which is a, a good consideration because it's something that we don't like to see a, um, a confected um, boiled lolly or jammy jamminess. Um, I think the fruit profile is is, is really correct and um, has our usual hallmark silky tannin. But yeah, the uh, Bannockburn 16 is um, a, a blend of the four vineyard parcels. So it has fruit in it from Cornish Point, from Calvert, from MacMure, and from Alms. Seven, 17 was cool. Okay. Eight, 18 was warm. Right, right, right.
but the 18s um have a little bit more depth and concentration than the 16s the 16s mm. are transparent and elegant and quite fine boned our picking dates don't vary that much but when we get rainfall or when we get heat or when we get cold mm. periods um vary some years we might have a a hot spring some years we might have a cold spring sometimes it it all seems to average out in the end but mm -hmm. What influences the style of wine is when you get the heat or when you don't get it. Um, and in 16, we had that heat early on. Mm. And that's how I think it affected the um, the color and the, the depth of the wine. Mm. Um, more so, even though 18 was a hotter year than 16 in general. We're pretty, um, uh, I mean, we're, 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 you know, investigate everything and, you know, everything is on the table all the time. Um, the biggest uh, variable for us would be the use of whole bunch. Mm -hmm. And so some years you could think that, you know, it's a good year for a lot of whole bunch, other years um, maybe not so. But we find that um, in a year like 16 where there's a lot of transparency I, 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 and, and also a high level of ripeness, um, uh, the, the two seem to counter each other out because you could argue that with the ripeness that it's a good year to use more whole bunch because you should have ripe flavor and ripe stem. But mm -hmm. then also I worry about um, that the grapes ripened too quickly, that they don't have the depth and concentration to support the um, stemmy flavor. And we really mm -hmm. don't want to see um, the herbaceousness or the, the green character from the stems coming through in the wines. So we'll tend to back off and, and moderate the, the, the use of whole bunch in a, in a hot year. And then in a cool year, um, for the opposite reasons, we're worried about the um, slight green flavor in the grapes, any sort of herbal notes that we don't want to be exacerbated by having you know, additional green flavor from the stem. So we'll moderate as well. So that, then the, the outcome of that is that you know, every year we seem to use around 20 to 25 percent whole bunch in almost every tank. If we go over 30 or 35 percent whole bunch, um, I just find the the the, the stemmy character, the whole bunch character becomes too pervasive on the wine and it starts to dominate and obscure the expression of the vineyard site. And I'd mm -hmm. rather have people talk about that this reminds them of block three or this reminds them of Cornish Point and that they can see the vineyard character than sort of start to talk about um, a winemaking method like the use of whole bunches. Oh, so, yeah, it's a very good question because um, in um, you know, pre-COVID, our vineyard team in the summertime, uh, we, we normally have about eight full-time people in the vineyard. And then in the summertime, we would take on an additional 12 to 15 people to help out with all the canopy management and all the work um, over the summer. And then that would lead into the harvest that they would um, remain for the, for the vintage. Um, and of the 12 to 15 extras, um, uh, virtually all of them would be young internationals, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them coming from wine growing regions in Europe. So um, France, Germany, Switzerland, um, North America, you know, Canada, USA, um, Australia. And it just brings a, you know, a vibrancy to, to, the, to, the, to the team. Um, you've got all these different personalities and cultures and diversity, uh, which we always um, really enjoyed. So we've missed that. We, we still had some of them in 2020. We certainly had them here in 20 because they became mm -hmm. like refugees. We called them COVID refugees because they didn't want to go home to their countries because COVID was ravaging um, most of the countries where they were from. Um, whereas New Zealand had that you know COVID free status. And so they all enjoyed um, remaining here for a year. But as you know, vaccinations rolled out and um, conditions eased in their, their home countries, um, virtually all of them returned. And um, so we're, we're left with um, uh, just Kiwis <laughs> and also some of the COVID refugees that have stayed on in New Zealand. We have um, one young English um, chap um, mm. who's applying for residency um, because he enjoys it here and doesn't want to go home. Um, and because our government um, has, has has respected those people, you know, for their choosing to stay here, they're um, you know offering them residency visas, so which is a really nice thing. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. So that's a, yeah, that's a significant difference. Um, mm. um, uh, and we 
we haven't seen a flood of applications. Normally we get lots of people already applying to come work with us for the next um, growing season. We haven't seen that just yet, um, but it'll be interesting to see how, you know, as the, as the young people start to travel the world again, um, just how that starts to pan out. And your door is open by the sounds of it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're desperate to um, have some help. You know, there's um, our vineyard workers. Uh, a lot of them haven't ha been able to take their normal holidays. There's mm. just been too much work on. Um, so everybody's looking for more help, um, you know, uh, right through across New Zealand, particularly um, hospitality and hotel industry is really suffering. A little bit more resilient to mm. um, changes in um, uh, changes in vintage, you know, conditions. Um, because Chardonnay is more malleable, you know, it does very well in warm climates and cool climates. So when we have those differences that um, uh, in the in the growing season, they'll be more obvious in the Pinot Noirs and the Chardonnays. The Chardonnays um, more harmonious from from year to year. Uh, Chardonnay, our style it hasn't changed. Um, you know, we we we've embarked on a um, a program of low amount of new oak a long long time ago, and in fact, for the block two, block six, they see no new oak. Um, we've also been able to um, bottle the wines without finding filtration, so that's um, just an inherent part of our our, our style and our production methods now. Um, so yeah, really excited with the the potential for Chardonnay. We have some um, young, um, some replanting in Chardonnay where we've improved the the clone and rootstock. Um, so they they're coming online. So our Chardonnay production is set to increase over the next few years, and that's going to be exciting because we have huge demand for Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, Riesling, the you know we've been doing the dry Riesling and the Bannockburn since the very first vintage, and then the um, very small parcel of Block One, um, the three Rieslings that we produce, um, and nothing has changed in the style there. Um, uh, you know, it's um, should be an expression of our Bannockburn terroir, our schist soils, um, a simple winemaking process. Um, and with the cool climate that we have in central Otago, you know, acidity is always going to be a good feature of the, the Riesling style that we produce. Mm. Uh, one of the main differences, say, with Australian Riesling that's, mm. you know, growing in a warmer climate, they uh, they tend to take on more of the um, uh, TDN, the, the mm. petroleum kerosene character. Um, and in our cool climate, we don't seem to get that character whatsoever. So the fruit remains very pure, very pristine. Um, as the wines age, they do take on sometimes a little hints of that, but um, it's not nearly as dominant. So, um, uh, you know, very stable aging um, mm. and almost almost timeless in the bottle. You know, they're, um, if we open a 20 year old Riesling, it's, you know, surprises people that it's that old um, because they still look so youthful and vibrant, fr vibrantly fruited. Yeah, there'll be vintage vintage variation. I mean, you will see, um, you know, certainly in a 21 that's only, um, you know, it's been in the bottle less than a year, you'll still see the the vibrant youthfulness of, of that wine. And then the 19 and the 17, you'll um, appreciate, um, you know, a settling down period where, you know, you can tell that the wine's been in bottle, you know, more than a couple of years. Um, because it's lost the, the mm -hmm. vibrant um, primary um, fruitiness that you know, um, very, you know, freshly bottled wines will show. So the seventeen and nineteen um, are relatively similar vintages. Um, seventeen just a little bit cooler, higher acidity, um, but both have you know very very good concentration. Um, Twenty one just a little bit warmer than um, uh, than nineteen. Um, that you know made made classic um, classic styles, um, mm -hmm. very good quality. Cool, thank you. I grew up on a farm, and so I you know enjoyed agriculture from a very young age. Um, it was also a market garden, so um, growing crops. My mum was a um, um, a very keen amenity gardener, so that was just part of my up. Bringing. So I went to university and studied horticultural science. I, I really enjoyed sciences, but I, I wanted uh, the practical application side of it. So that's why I studied horticultural science. And in the third year of my degree, I spent on an exchange program to Oregon State University. And that's where I got exposed to um, wine science and, and viticulture. And um, when I returned to finish my degree the following year, um, 
my university, Lincoln uh, mm. College, as it was called back then in Canterbury, um, had just started a program in um, viticulture and enology. So I was able to take those classes. Uh, you know, found something that I really enjoyed, um, and I thought I'll um, you know, go work in wineries just straight after graduating, and just really enjoyed the work and the the passion, um, the comb unique combination of science, artistry, um, uh, and you know, eventually, you know, when when I got this position at Felton Road. Um, um, you know, the, the sales and marketing side of it and, you know, the whole business aspect of it as well um, in, a, in a small business rather than just pure winemaking. I think, you know, a huge passion for, for wine, you know, just that, you know, you, you just love reading wine, wine books and wine magazines, um, attending tastings, uh, taking every opportunity that you can to taste as widely and deeply as you possibly can. Um, try to try to meet um um wealthy collectors who are willing to share their nice bottles and um harder and harder to um you know yeah. taste some of the world's great wines because they're becoming so collectible and so expensive i was fortunate um and still am you know that i've i, I know lots of people that you know will open um um you know you know very revered bottles and i, I get exposed to those so um i think that's really critical is to understand you know the the depth of quality and also what's come before you know the history and tradition of wine i think is really important to to understand to be able to carve out your niche and um, have respect for um, the great wines of the world i think um uh i you know I'll, I'll still be here i'm i'm very fortunate that i'm uh, i have a small interest in the business so that's um uh means i don't have to uh, sort of look to go start my own enterprise to become a, a family legacy um i don't have that same um same need so i'll still be here at felton road um hopefully my body still allows me to uh, be as physical i i love the um the physicality of, of working in the cellars and and working the vintage because our our winemaking here is extremely seasonal about 95 percent of the work is done from february to may um uh, and then the rest of the year, I have the you know the the, the diversity of um, looking after the sales and overseeing and working with the, the other team members here um, in selling the wine. So I really enjoy that um, that, that change of season and diversity of the work. So um, uh, I've always enjoyed the travel, uh, particularly to Japan. Um, hopefully um, that can resume at some stage that, um, you know, we can get out and, and, and visit with our customers and um, the relationships that we have with importers like yourselves. Um, you know, uh, these, these many of these relationships are more than 20 years old now. And, you know, we have a fabulous network of importers, you know, globally that um, in 40 different countries that sell our wine. So, and I, that's a huge part of the wine business is um, that relationship with your import and distrib distribution partners. Um, so hopefully that um, that returns because it's it's been a quiet couple of years. We haven't seen anybody here at the winery for two over two years now, um, and um, you know we look forward to getting out and also receiving people. As a winemaker, what it, what is unique is um, compared to a lot of other um, you know, beverage and food production is that you know we only get one one harvest a year and only one chance to make a wine. So I've been uh, fortunate. Um, I've been at Felton Road for twenty six years. So uh, every year is, is is incredibly different. You know, no two seasons are the same. Um, so it's not as though you you come to work on the first day of vintage and say oh this is going to be easy this is going to be like last year <laughs> i know how to do it uh, every year there's you know the grapes come in you know ripen in a different manner they respond differently in the winery so you've got to be adaptable and sort of come up with new plans on how to um, deal with all the fruit um, as it's coming in and the and the fermentations and how to optimize and then you're taking all of that um a acquired knowledge from previous growing seasons and, and previous wines that you've made and you've seen go to bottle and looking back on them and sort of thinking, oh, this sort of reminds me of 2016 or 2011. 
what was it about those seasons then what did we do that i felt was right or what could we improve on and so you're always you know drawing on that sometimes we might even rush to the you know the library and pull out some bottles and sit down with the team and sort of say you know what do you think of these you know what could we have done better in that year um you know what what should we be doing this year so there's always a um you know you're always learning we we, we never know how to do it um and we have to remind ourselves that um uh um there's you know still so much to to understand and learn about wine growing and wine making We've got our heads in the sand too much but um you know we are a small winery you know we produce 10 to 12,000 cases of wine a year um yes maybe maybe our market is quite conservative and because the wines are not inexpensive so mm -hmm. we are appealing to um I guess a demographic that's a, a little wealthier and understands a little bit more about wine. I think if you're a larger production winery um, and selling, you know, mid or low priced wines, I think it would be um, more of a concern. Um, so hopefully those wineries, the other ones are paving the way for people to graduate mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to our position. Um, but yeah, no, I think it is a big concern that, um, you know, trends and fashions change what people drink people are I, yeah are, like you said are way more alcohol sensitive nowadays but hopefully there will be still a place for you know fine high quality wine in moderation with with great food and great company so uh, we have to I'd, I'd like to think that in the rest of my lifetime um we're not going to get challenged by that but um in in general um yeah the, the attitudes will, will definitely change yeah i think you know you said it before you know it's uh um alcohol is uh in our wines you know 10 to 14 and a half percent of the the um the the composition of the wine and so that gives a body and a mouthfeel that supports the acidity the tannin the flavor the aroma so um uh you know and alcohol is um it has a warming um and not not just the alcohol there the glow and that that um but it it gives a warmth to the to the mid palate of the wine if you i i i did a lot of sensory science at university and we we would do taste standards with varying percentages of alcohol and it has a massive effect on the character and the quality of the wine so um i think it would be a very a big challenge to because you take the alcohol out of it and you've stripped, you know, a major component and then you're trying to talk about terroir and the expression of a particular site, which is really important to us. But then you've manipulated the wine so much by um, taking something out of it that's supposed to be there. We did it the day after the invasion. Oh, oh really? Wow. <laughs> mm. we, we, we sent them an email and said, um, mm. you know, we, we do not long, no longer are going to support or supply the market. Um, they owe us quite a bit of money. Um, yeah. Uh, and we, we wrote that off. Um, we immediately sent um, uh, $30,000 to Medici Medicine Sans Frontieres, uh, the aid agency that works. Mm. They, they already were working in U Ukraine in the eastern part. Mm -hmm. And then we've credited um, our wines. Um, we're in, the, in our importer, our Ukrainian importers warehouse got um, bombed. And mm -hmm. so they lost 15 million euros worth of wine. Wow. Oh my God. So oh. we, and they had already paid us for that wine in advance. Um, and so we've uh, credited that and also going to supply the next vintage free of charge to them uh, mm. in support. Um, mm -hmm. We get a daily email from them. It's just really, um, that's really sad. It's um, yeah. so sad, yeah. so sad to see in this day and age that you know we have such atrocities still happening. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the, so the Van Gri, we used to do more um, regularly um, in previous vintages because we had more young vines, mm -hmm. and in young vine vineyards, um, in certain weather conditions, um, they can throw um, bigger bunches and bigger berries than what we would like. Uh, as optimal for, for making mm -hmm. high quality Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. So the Van Gris is simply a method that I saw in Burgundy for um, uh, restoring that balance of the um, skin to juice ratio. So immediately after destemming, we can draw off um, up to 10%. Um, sometimes it's only seven or 8% of the juice. 
um, before it's had a chance to pick up any color. And mm -hmm. so therefore you're essentially concentrating um, that remaining um, juice to skin ratio in, in the vat. And so we did it last in 2016 um, mm -hmm. when we had, uh, you know, it was a, a good size vintage, it was warm and we feared for the concentration of the wine. So mm -hmm. that's why we did, um, um, a, it's called a saigne, um, the French word to bleed. So you're bleeding off some of the juice. Um, and then in 21, we had uh, a full size vintage um, and we just, uh, it was mainly at Cornish Point because of the soils there had responded to a rain event and had bigger berries than what we'd like. So we, we um, bled off some of the juice and mm -hmm. made a small amount of Van Gris in 21. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've made a, again in 22, um, a, a small amount again as well. So we have another one in 2022. We have a, a replant program, just, um, you know, our, our oldest vines um, were planted in 1992 and they're still thriving, although phylloxera is, is, a, um, is a threat because some of our original plantings are on their own roots, mm -hmm. but we are over 80% planted on rootstock, so um, mm -hmm. we're not that, um, not that vulnerable. But um, sometimes we find that um, a certain site might be better in Chardonnay than it is in Pinot Noir. It might be better on a, a different rootstock. Um, there's new clones that, you know, always being evaluated, um, um, particularly on our own sites where we have a, a very diverse range of clones. And um, so, yeah, we're... We didn't do any plant replanting last year. We don't have any coming up this year, but in 2023 and 24, we have some um, small areas that we're going to replant. And it's to continue to evolve the vineyard to better um, you know, rootstocks, better clones, um, uh, better trellis, um, uh, better vineyard design. So um, uh, just small, small amounts, you know, it's probably less than less than 5% or 3%, you know, every two or three years, but it, it adds up over time. Because what you don't want to do is have your vineyard mature all at the same time. Mm. So in 30 years time sure. for say Nigel's children to inherit a vineyard that's all the vines are 60 years old and um, <laughs> then they have to pull them all out at once and then more or less start <laughs> over again. So you want to you want to have a gradual, slow, ever, um, you know, uh, restoration <laughs> of the vineyard. Yeah. yeah. So MacMure Vineyard um, is a good example of what I was just talking about before. Mm. Um, it was planted in 2012 uh, and we used um, a higher um, uh, higher density in the planting than because than, it's it's only um, 300 meters from Calvert. Um, mm -hmm. It was um, uh, so very similar soils to Calvert, but we have a, a, a slightly more west of north row orientation and a much higher vine density there. And also we have um, uh, improved rootstock and improved clonal material on that property. And so we haven't an announced it yet, but it'll it'll be coming out in our, um, our allocation offer that'll be getting on to in about two or three weeks time. Um, but we have a single vineyard wine from MacMure that we're gonna be bottling this year for the very first time. Um, because the quality is, is, is outstanding and largely due to those um, uh, you know, the vineyard improvements with the vine density mm -hmm. and, and clones and rootstocks. I mean, that's the beauty of having vineyard designates is that um, uh, the character and the personality of that particular vineyard should come through each year, as opposed to the other approach that we could have taken would be, um, you know, winemakers reserve and that, you know, we only bottle it when we see that the quality is is, is exceptional. But I mean, we're blessed in Central Otago with our vintage conditions that are very consistent. So um, every year, the you know wine quality might vary slightly. Um, personality um, varies even more, but that's what people love to follow is the um, the effect of the different season on you know the vineyard character. So um, it's an easier decision to just bottle them every year. You know, we've never mm -hmm. seen a reason not to bottle a Block Three or a Block Five or a Calvert, for example.